This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. Welcome to our 21st annual Writers' Symposium by the Sea at Point Loma Nazarene University. I'm Dean Nelson on the journalism faculty at the university, and it's our great honor to have our distinguished guest, Dick Enberg, with us tonight. A broadcaster, essayist, witness to some of the most amazing sports events in history. He's been the announcer of the UCLA Bruins during their championship years. He's seen everything from basketball to football to baseball. He's announced it, he's witnessed it. Olympics, Super Bowls, tennis tournaments, golf tournaments, and then he has told us about it and helped us see it and feel it. He's won 13 Emmys. He was the National Sportscaster of the Year. He is in the Baseball Hall of Fame. He's in the Hollywood Walk of Fame. He's the only sportscaster alive, there's only been one other, uh, who has been in the Hall of Fame in basketball, football, and baseball. There's even a Dick Enberg Award in, in college sports. He's entering his last season as the broadcaster and announcer for the San Diego Padres this year. And the reason he is here is that he's a terrific writer. His memoir, Oh My, a phrase he has made famous, is a great read. His stage play called Coach, the untold story of college basketball legend Al McGuire has won several stage awards. But many of us know him for those poignant poetic moments, those essays that he does at the end of the Olympics, or at the end of golf tournaments or tennis matches. They are some of the most moving television you'll ever see. Dick, it is an honor and a privilege to have you at our Writers Symposium this year. Uh, thank you, Dean. Thank you. You've said that to be a good sportscaster, you have to be a good writer. I would have never thought that. I figured you guys just show up and start gabbing. Why, why do you have to be a good writer? No, the best sportscasters, you go back through the years, they all were outstanding writers. Uh, Al Michaels today, Keith Jackson come to mind. Jack Whitaker was terrific with his essays. In fact, I borrowed his idea. Uh, you have to think like a writer. You have to think beginning, middle, and end. You have to think storyline. You have to introduce the characters. You have to be cognizant of how you have set up uh, the drama of any game. Every game is like a book, and there's never two alike. You can't just go back and read an old one and plug it into the current and, and be able to fit in the storyline at the end of the telecast, the end of the game, so that the audience now feels at least refreshed that you began on a, on a point and you finished with that point and you wrapped up the storyline so you can close that chapter or that book and go on to the next game. And uh, it, it does require thinking the way a writer thinks storyline. So while you're in the booth, are you thinking what, that I need to be painting a, a vivid picture here? Are you thinking like writers do about description and character and things like that? Well, a lot of that is, you know, you think about that in your preparation for the game. I, oh, okay. I spend three hours uh, at least before every baseball game. Football, uh, my formula was I would spend three days for, uh, for a three-hour football game, at least a full day for a three-hour game in preparation for all the things that you, you don't know what's going to happen. I mean, you, you have to to be ready to receive it and digest it, assimilate it, and give it back to your audience. Hopefully, we're at least a good docent so that we can help you understand and appreciate uh, the event that you've taken time to watch. So it's, um, I feel like a fraud now. I'm gonna, I want a disclaimer right now. Yeah, yeah. Because to right. me, to me, a, a great writer, and I, I'm far from that, a writer is one that can come up with a, uh, an idea, a concept, and write a book, a, a novel. I and mean, that takes true talent in, in writing. Uh, some of you may have seen Owen uh, Shears, who was here recently with the Literary Society. He's written a book, uh, I think it's The Man I Saw. 
Uh, and he talked about the throb that a writer has to get mm -hmm. if you're going to write a novel. First, you have to have that throb. Okay, now I got it. Now I'm, it's pulsating. Now I can write around the throb. Now, as a, a broadcaster, I write in reverse. You know, when I was being taught how to write, basically the system was you write the way you read. So you start with the beginning chapter and you write your way through. No, I, I go the reverse. I want to know how it's going to end first. So I write backwards. Here's my ending, and now I can pull it forward and set up uh, the beginning. And I don't, you know, there's a great quote. I've got to use it right now so I don't forget. <laughs> the economy of words that someone can write so brilliantly, that they can say so much. I mean, Hemingway did that, didn't he, in such short sentences, right. able to paint such beautiful pictures. But Red Smith was the sports editor of the New York Times and won a Pulitzer Prize. Hey, sportscasters or sports writers don't get Pulitzer Prizes, but he got one. And his colleagues at the time said, Red, you are such a brilliant writer. Why don't you spend your time doing more significant writing? You could go into politics or the metropolitan section or whatever. Why do you stay in sports? His answer in these three words is so brilliant and says so, so much in such little verbiage. I stay in sports, he said, because truth strangles fiction. Isn't that beautiful? Truth strangles fiction. And so we don't have to come up with the throb and the whole idea to write our book. We have the truth there before us, and we just try to write it as it unfolds and dictates to us what we can say. He, he really was amazing as a, uh, as a writer and as an editor, and he could come up with the human kind of pathos, you know, of, of sports. I think you do a, a very similar thing, so, which, which we're going to get into. But, but I, wanted, I, I was reading at the kind of schedule you kept when you were announcing UCLA basketball games. You did this for a really long time. During one period in particular, you would announce a UCLA Bruins game in L.A., you drive to LAX, fly all night to the Midwest or the East Coast, announce the game of the week that afternoon, then fly back to LAX. Gaining the three hours. Yeah. Gaining the three hours, yeah. <laughs> Can't discount that. And, and then you'd announce another Bruins game that night. You, you did that. That's, how are you even still upright? <laughs> Well, um, that's why I'm married twice as well. Um, the, uh, we'll get into that, that too. That, <laughs> uh, uh, that was, uh, hey, you didn't want to say no. In our business, it's tough to say no, because there are so many people lined up that want to say yes. And you know, I've been working for 60 years. I mean, I've been employed for 60 years and not worked a day. I love what I do. I get paid to go to the greatest game, sit next to a Hall of Famer, pick his brain, enjoy the action, challenged by this will be a little different, how are we gonna handle this one? Uh, so it's, um, y y I wanted to prove, frankly, I grew up in the Midwest, I wanted to go back and do those uh, afternoon games so people back where I grew up would say, hey, Dick Enberg actually can do this? And so uh, <laughs> there was a price, and there was one instance where it got me, where we had done a game in Chicago and we're flying back, so it's, let's say the game is one to three, and then you, by the time you get it to O'Hare, it's 4.30, but really only 1.30 our or 2.30 our time. So you get on the plane, we're cruising along, we're gonna be just fine, and then the uh, pilot comes on and says, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have a problem. Uh, the fog has uh, enveloped the Los Angeles airport, and we're not going to be able to land, we're gonna land in Ontario, and we'll bus you into Los Angeles. Well, I looked at my watch and said, there's no way. By the time I'm in that bus, the game's already started. And, and what happened was, they didn't, and there was no preparation for it. They started the telecast with no announcer. They just went on the air with a basketball game. And so just, the band is playing. Yeah, and, and the thing in the crowd, you're in crowd and they hear the basketball bouncing and all of that. So I'm, I'm finally in uh, a car picking me up in Ontario and listening to the game in the second half on the radio. Now we were delayed, we delayed our telecast and they came on the air at 11 o'clock and replayed them at 11. So I've got until 11 o'clock to get to the studio now, not the game, the game will be over. I go to the studio. But what was fun was I got to hear the second half on the radio. So when I went back into the studio to recreate what was left, I mean, there's about four minutes left in the first half, so I 
picked it up there, took it all the way to the end. At the end of the game, and UCLA was winning, I was able to say, boy, you know, it'd be nice if Shearer here had got a shot from the corner. You know, he's been really hot. Oh! No way. <laughs> oh, my! <laughs> so it all worked out. You know, that, <laughs> you know that thing you said about being a fraud earlier? <laughs> I think we've identified it now. Well, all right, so you, you, when you talked about all the preparation that you, uh, that you do for a game and, and all, I, I was really, really impressed by the way. You're one of the few people who got Ted Williams to talk to you, but you, it was because you were prepared. Well, it, it was. Ted Williams was my idol. I grew up on a farm in Michigan, and uh, you know, for whatever reason, T uh, Ted Williams, I wanted to be Ted Williams. I taught myself to bat left-handed, and, and uh, whenever Boston would come to Detroit, uh, I would hitchhike with my buddy down into the city, and we knew where the players stayed at the old Book Cadillac Hotel. And, and one day, here comes Ted Williams out with a manager, Pinky Higgins, and they walked from down Michigan Avenue to the ballpark. My buddy and I walked out. They take a step, we take a step, never, never stopping to ask for an autograph, much less a handshake. If they'd look in a window, we'd stop, look in the window. And, and we were just so excited to be that close to Ted Williams, uh, the, the great hitter here from San Diego. So now I become, fast forward, in 1969, Gene Autry had uh, the opportunity to hire other people, and he selected me to be, from that pre and post game show in the microphone days, uh, to be the play-by-play -play announcer of the Angels in 69. And that same year, Ted Williams became the manager of the Washington Senators. So they're coming through the league, and part of our responsibility on radio and television is to do that pre- and post-game show. It's, it really is a demon to have to deal with, but that comes with the territory. And here comes Williams and Washington to Anaheim Stadium, and they've gone through the whole league, and they finally get to Anaheim Stadium. Now, Ted did not like the press. Uh, he was an irascible guy, and he just got burned in Boston, and, and we all fell into the same category. We're all ink-stained wretches. So I, I said, well, he's coming, and it's my turn to do the pregame show. Ted Williams is my idol. I'm going to get him to be on the pregame show. And my partner laughed. And so I go through his autobiography, my turn at bat, to read, see maybe there'll be something there. And then I went to the baseball register, and there it was in 19... 41, Ted Williams for the Red Sox pitched an inning and two thirds against Detroit. He was a fine pitcher here as a high schooler in San Diego, still may hold the most strikeouts in a game. So I figured that's it. That's your hook. There's my hook. At least, you know, he's not going to be able to deny me here because I'm not going to ask him about hitting. I'm going to go down and ask him about pitching. So Williams is in the dugout, and the writers are all circling around, no one daring to get inside his electrical field. And I come little. <laughs> tippy shoes down, uh, the, uh, my white shoes down the dugout steps, and Williams is staring out as a team taking batting practice. And I said, Mr. Williams, I'm Dick Enberg. That's my first year. I'm the announcer with the California Angels. Didn't even look at me. And uh, I'm doing the pregame show, and I'd be honored. After all, you were my idol. I know that doesn't matter, but you were my idol. Try to be like you've done look at me. And I said, I promise you, in the interview, I won't ask you one question about hitting. He looked at me like that. I said, I want to talk to you about the time you pitched for the Red Sox against the Tigers, struck out Rudy York. He looked over and says, come here, meat. <laughs> That's an endearing term, by the way. <clears throat> and he never forgot me. And whenever he came uh, to town or we were in Boston, he would look me up. He didn't always know my name. And then, of course, later in his life and in my life, we moved to San Diego and Ted would come back for various events. And he'd always say, hey, you want to have breakfast? We'll talk a little baseball. Can you imagine the, that circle? Here you are, a farm kid trying to be this great, hit, maybe the greatest hitter of all time. And eventually, life takes you all the way around, and your hero calls you and asks you if you want to talk baseball with him. Isn't that great? I mean, it's all right. Because you did your homework. Exactly. He wouldn't have talked to me if I wanted to ask the questions that everyone else was asking. Exactly. Exactly. You know, you talk about being uh, being a kid in uh, in Michigan. You used, to, uh, you used to announce your own games with you as the player, didn't you? You played all the positions and you announced now batting well, right-handed. I mean, you Denver. don't have any playmates on a farm. There's no one around. <laughs> you, you get to play all the positions. Yeah. No, we, uh, I, I created a game 
we had a dirt road, and then the telephone wires were across the road and a culvert across the road. And I'd stand, I get the, any farm has some perfect size rocks to hit, and I had an old baseball bat. And if it was a left-handed hitter coming up in the lineup, I'd hit left, and if it was a right-hander, I'd hit right. And if I didn't get it over the road, that was an out. If I got it into the culvert, it was a single. If I got it under the lines, a double. If I hit it over the lines, it was a home run. I didn't know what I did with for triples, but anyway. And, and I, would, I would make up my own games and call the games. And so without ever realizing that someday uh, announcing would be my life, here I was already practicing the craft. You remember when uh, uh, your mom asked you one time why you were eating so fast? Yeah, I, we, I, uh, this is actually uh, before uh, we moved to Michigan. During the war, we lived in the San Fernando Valley, and we had a big dirt field next to us. And I would start in the middle of the field, and I had memorized the lineups of the Hollywood Stars and the LA Angels of the Pacific Coast League. And I'd uh, start with a tennis ball in the middle of the field, and I would, you know, the first hitter up is a left-handed hitting whatever, and I'd hit left-handed. Now here comes uh, Bill Sarney for the Angels, and I'd hit right-handed the other way. And I'd hit back and forth and calling it all the way until the ball would go off the field, and that would be a run. And I would play back and forth uh, to what would be a, at least a seven-inning game. So one day, I'm, I come in for dinner, and my mother's got the nice dinner on the table, and I'm really gobbling it. I said, Dick, slow down. What's your hurry? What's going on? I said, Mom, I'm trying to get in a double header, you know? <laughs> so. <laughs> you've, you've seen pretty much everything in sports, but let's, let's talk about the things that, that you could see that the rest of us couldn't and then you wrote them as your essays in whether it's your Enberg moments or, or whatever, you'd find these stories and these themes, they were just so poignant and so respectful, so quirky. How did you even find those? I mean, you, everybody pays attention to, okay, they're skiing down, this person wins. And then at the end of the day, you, you come up with something completely out of the blue. Where Are you they? looking for those all the time? Yeah, you know where they are? Hmm. In your heart. That's where I found my stories. I mean, you have to, every writer needs imagination, whether you're writing a novel or a story on true life. But, but I write with my heart, and that's why I said I was a fraud. I think a, a, an outstanding writer, think about this, folks, an outstanding writer can write the letter that tells someone, I don't love you anymore. We can all write the love letter when we're romantically inclined to somebody we care about deeply. We're all writers then, but, but if you can write the good letter when you don't love the person, now that's talent. So my fortune. My, something to aspire for. I'll, I'll, yeah. Yeah. But, but my good fortune is I love what I do and I'm dealing with things that touch my heart. The Olympic Games give you stories every day that are so uh, meaningful and, and uh, emotional that I want to share that. I get emotional, so maybe I can write well enough that the audience will feel the same way. Well, you, you'd come up with these topics, though, the, the eyes of an athlete, where an athlete is looking. Or instead of the gymnast uh, coach, Bella Carolla, you, you did a story on his wife, Marta, you know, who's, who hates being in the spotlight, and somehow you got her in the spotlight. Or uh, it, just these, these quirky things. You, you could focus on the footwork of a tennis player or the, the grunts and screams of the hammer thrower. Uh, even putting a 100-meter dash to a, a Beethoven symphony. I mean, you, you did these just quirky, different kinds of things that just moved people. And, I, and, I'm, and I'm just, do you, is that just you? Or did you just think, OK, at these Olympics, I'm going to go move somebody? Well, the, the, I don't have to think it. It's going to happen. Hmm. The, the stories are going to come to us. <clears throat> we. Uh, uh, classics. The, uh, I'm proud of them, by the way, the 100 meters. The idea of the 100 meters, here's the, here's the quickest way you can win a gold medal in sports. You only have to run 10 seconds and you win a gold medal, right? And, and yet, how do we televise that and appreciate all that goes into running for 10 seconds? I mean, the very best are doing something really special, but how, how do we really allow the audience to appreciate it? So it was in the early days of the super slow-mo camera 
where we could slow it down to everything, a, a, a speedster to a walk relatively. And now in slow motion, you're seeing how a sprinter uses his upper body and how his cheeks uh, fall as he takes each step. And I thought, now how am I, the trouble with that, we had the, the video and it's about three minutes. We've taken a 10 seconds and made it three minutes. But how, how can I write to that? I mean, there, I can set it up, but all, it, it's really a human symphony. So why don't I borrow Beethoven and break it down into four movements and use Beethoven underneath the slow motion of these brilliant athletes and these great bodies stretching for the tape and, and winning the 100 meters. So, uh, you get lucky sometimes, and, but you have to think outside the box, yeah. and, and, and your heart helps you to get there. You also would do stories that were so much deeper than just the stories you were telling. Um, oftentimes, there would be this subtext of, this is actually a story about fathers and sons, you know, like Tiger Woods and his dad, or, or the, the, the piece you did on Arthur Ashe. On the one hand, that was about Arthur Ashe, but on the other hand, that was a story about race. And it was, it was just so much deeper. Is that an intentional thing on your part? Are you looking for that deeper thing? Because no, it sure comes through. It's a responsibility of the writer, isn't it? I mean, uh, anyone can just write the facts. I mean, you can, just like anyone can go to a ballpark and take my microphone and say, ground ball to short, throw to first, six, three, put out. You could all do that. But what do you do when the pitcher doesn't throw the ball? What, is, what, what do you say then? And what do you say when, uh, someone is injured at second base and you haven't seen that before. How do you cover that? Or uh, what if you say there's a long delay of any kind? Uh, you know, I'd like to think that I'm prepared to say, you know, I went to the Old Globe last night. I saw this great piece of theater and it you know, really ties in with, maybe it tied in with baseball or hmm. with a play in baseball. Let me, let me give you, I'm going to expose myself now. I, I've already had, as a fraud. I'm going to expose myself in a different way. So we're, this is really getting interesting yeah, now. Yeah, it is. Yeah. The, uh, the, on television, when somebody asks you to write a feature piece uh, about someone or something, it, it usually happens this way. They, they cut a three-minute piece. Let's say it's a, uh, a story of uh, a Greco-Roman wrestler who is uh, trying to win the first gold medal ever in the Olympics with his wife watching and his six-year-old daughter sitting on the wife's lap. And luckily, the producer had mic'd the wife. And so in the process, by shooting, uh, uh, having a camera locked in on them, shooting not only the wife, but shooting the little girl who had her fingers crossed the whole time her daddy was wrestling for a, for a gold medal. Now, uh, in, in a normal situation, they'd say, we've got something really special, Enberg. Here it is. We've cut it. It's all set, three and a half minutes, and go ahead and write to it, which, you know, I can do that. But, you know, then I don't really feel like I've really had not just my heart, my soul in it. So the way I like to do my pieces is I, uh, I tell them the shots that I want. I write it in advance knowing that I saw those shots and I know they'll find them for me and mm -hmm. it takes a lot of hard work for them. So that when, my word, when I've written my words, I have the visual uh, background and support to, to my words. So that's why I say I'm, ex I'm exposing myself because I'm writing to video. Video is the power. Video is the, is the motivating force. And I just write in my mind to the video they're about to see. And it just, it really does connect. I'll give you an example. Some of you may remember it. Um, Tiger Woods was playing uh, at the, um, it wasn't the Masters, I don't think it was the, I think it was the PGA. And the first round, they put Jack Nicholas, the idol of Tiger Woods, uh, with, with Tiger and matched them in the first round. And so here's Woods playing with his idol. He had Nicholas's uh, uh, picture on his wall as a kid and that sort of thing. And it was just one piece of video that I saw. I said, I've got a piece. There was a moment during the course of uh, the action where um, Nicholas, uh, is standing, uh, and, uh, and, and Woods is walking through the shot and realizes he's walking in front of Nicholas and walks behind him. And then as the two of them stood waiting for the, the, the next man to play his ball, probably a putt, Nicholas was standing, with, leaning on his club with his left hand on his hip, and uh, Woods is sitting, standing next to him, and what does Woods do? He puts his stuff and takes the same pose. I said, oh, wow, yeah. I could write to that. I mean, yeah. anybody can write to that. And then other things opened up around that. So there was my throb, and then I was yeah. able to build a piece around it. So, so much of what you, you did in those Enberg moments or, or those essays 
had this theme of struggle about it, where on the one hand, like I'm, I'm thinking of the, the runner from Niger who, who came in, I, I think she finished two laps behind everybody else. And that's what you locked in on was, it wasn't about winning, it was about, it was about struggle. And that really resonated with audiences. I mean, on the one hand, we love a winner, but you would then point out, ah, oh, there's so much more to this than, than winning. Um, and it, it's, it's how hard this is. And this, this, you were drawn to that. Well, we're all taught that. It's that the Olympic spirit is to compete well. Yeah. And, and it's not just, a, you know, it's nice to win a gold medal, but most everyone that goes to the Olympic Games come home without a medal. Uh, their joy and thrill has to come from competing and competing well. And here was this young girl uh, who represented her country, first woman ever from Niger to compete, and she finished well behind. Everyone else had finished, and the crowd just waiting, and finally into the stadium she comes, uh, whether it was the marathon or the 10,000 meters, mm -hmm. a long race. And the crowd gave her as big an ovation, or maybe bigger than the winner. And so that is the spirit of the competition in the Olympics, that we can recognize that playing and trying and competing well is as important as standing on the victory stand. Uh, and uh, I think that resonates well with the fans. I think everybody who watches sports can identify with, with the, the player or the athlete that's not as good as the star. Because yeah. we all maybe wanted to be that star. I did. Maybe that's where it comes from. I wanted to be the athlete that somebody wrote about. I wasn't good enough. I had to see it from my position on the bench. <laughs> so yeah. maybe, maybe that helped me to, to, to cheer uh, all of them, not just the stars. I heard somebody say one time that one of the great gifts uh, that sports gives you, if you participate in them, is that it, gives, it teaches you how to lose. Does that make sense? Well, yeah. I, that, I, as a high school uh, student, I was... Uh, in a little farm town, 33 in my graduating class, show you how uh, inept we were. I was the center on the basketball team at 5'11 and a half. That counts for my nose. I, was just, I guarded a guy five, six inches taller than me, and he was just elbow high to my nose. I said, oh, not again. He got hit again. <laughs> and I fouled out of every game. And we won two games the whole season. So I know how to lose. I mean, yeah. But, you know, you do appreciate the wins when you lose all you the do. time. And that's important. And as you well. can empathize then with, with others who aren't winning. Absolutely. Although right. I hope the Padres win 162 games in a row. That's a... <laughs> I, th I think they promised us that. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm you can't sure. win them all if you don't win the first one. That's the key. <laughs> so so some, you've talked about writing to video and, and things. Sometimes you've had to write under such pressure that you had to write multiple endings because you didn't know how something was going to finish. How do, how do you even do that? Well, at the Masters, the, uh, that's what happens, or especially at a golf tournament. You know, you, the worst thing for the writer here, you, you kind of package uh, the morning of the final round other pieces. Like, for example, um, I did uh, a little essay on uh, this being a gentleman's game and how golfers honor their sport, I think, better than any other athletes in any other sport, certainly far better than tennis players. I often thought, I wish I could get the tennis players to go to a golf tournament and see how they treat the game, the public, hmm. and uh, even the media. And so I did a piece on uh, at the 18th when they hole out at the end of a championship and shake hands, they take off their cap when they sh shake hands. Just a, it's a little moment, but it, it's a gentleman's moment. And it's recognizing your opponent and appreciating the fact that he helped you to compete and to play that day. So I had that, one of those already prepackaged. Now I've got to, obviously, the final piece has to be who wins the Masters. Well, we come make the turn, and there's five guys that are in, I'm almost tied, or certainly in the hunt to win the, uh, this uh, prestigious tournament. So I had to go quickly write for all five as if they're going to win it. And I've got about an hour and a half to maybe hour 45 to, to sort this all out. So I, have, I, I go in and I record all five. And then when I see with two, to, now it's down to two with, at the 17th. And then by the 18th, hopefully I have enough left in the tank that I can s sell the whole package, tie it in with the other pieces I did prior to uh, announcing the, the champion. Of course, you always have that wonderful shot of the winner with his children and his wife and the hugs and all the rest. But, um, you know, that's just, 
that was the only choice you have. You can't wait till the last minute and ad lib it. They had me there to write, not to ad lib. And it just sounds so frantic, though. Well, yeah, we did a lot of running. The trucks are way off the uh, course, and we would run from our studio, the Butler Cabin, which is kind of fun to work in the Butler Cabin, but I had to run all the way back, or a golf cart all the way back to the trucks and the studios and cut the pieces and make sure that everything made sense. One of the times, <clears throat> It was just, it, to us, it was a disaster. But it proved how important in writing for television, music plays, how important the music plays in every piece. If you have the right music and you can time it to the, the cuts of the action, it just, uh, it sells. It's, it's more important than the words sometimes. And in fact, really good television sometimes, no words, let the music tell the story. So we've done this really wonderful piece. And, uh, in the process of placing the music, there's a couple of, I don't understand the technical aspect of our business, but there's a couple of ways you put the, the sound, actual sound on one thing and a, the, my voice on another and somehow it all magically comes together. So they lead to the butler cabin, here's the piece, and they roll it and there's no music. That somehow or another the, the music didn't get on there. So they're, now the video's playing. Where you know the train has left the depot. The music's playing, and the engineer. The only thing he could do at CBS was grab the theme music, the golf theme music for CBS and the Masters, and he slaps that on there. So at least there's music. Made no sense to anything that I wrote. And when it was all over, we went back to the truck. My producer and I. I mean, he was ready to impale himself on his mashie. I mean, he just he was really so upset. We go back and said, "Hey, great piece, Enberg. That was really." terrific. He said, are you kidding me? And they didn't even recognize. It was good enough that the wrong music still played. And then we, the next day, replayed it with the right music. And then... Then it was good. Then we, we were very happy. Yeah. So you still, I, before you were a broadcaster, you were a teacher. You're a professor. Um, this is the direction you thought you were headed. But I don't know. You're still, you still kind of see yourself as a teacher, don't you? Oh, yeah. I, I mean, in fact, after next year, um, you know, I have had a couple of offers to go back and teach. I have a lot to give. Uh, I, I would have to write another book because there really isn't a book on sports casting, how to do an interview, how to make your spotting boards, how do you prepare, how do you do this and that. I mean, there's sports casters that have written books that tell the, their interesting moments as a sports caster, mm -hmm. and I can feed those into it as well. So that would be, that would be fun. And I, I, I truly enjoy being in, in a classroom. You know, people say, well, what are the most exciting times in your life? I say, you know, the most exciting times in my life was when I was in a classroom teaching and we had 50 motivated students and the hand would go up, your brightest student's hand would go up, the challenge of the raised hand, and you'd get it every day. Every day you'd get the challenge of the raised hand. And it really was a test of how good you were. Could you answer? And I used to play almost a bit when I first started. I, I had such a nervous stomach. Doing the Super Bowl, I wasn't as nervous as the first year I was teaching. I mean, I was hunt, running to the bathroom before every class. And, and, uh, uh, and, and I played a game. I said, I, I, if I didn't know, I'd say, I don't know. And the second time I said, I don't know, I would just say, I, I can't say it again. I can't strike out. Three, three I don't knows in a, in a 50 minute lesson uh, were, were too much. But um, t to see the, See the sparkle. See, you know, in many ways, you're, you're uh, doing what uh, I, I do now on television. My television audience is maybe 140 million at a Super Bowl. I don't see the raised hand, but I can anticipate that that guy out there in Des Moines, Iowa, may, may not have gotten that point. Or, uh, you know, uh, someone over in Poway, Mud Grant, the way you said that, maybe I ought to repeat it in a different way. Is that what you mean? If not, then would you explain it again mm. so that that raised hand out there in Poway says, oh, now I get it. That's it. Okay. So yeah. teaching has helped me work in this new classroom. I wonder if that's one of the reasons why you so resonated with John Wooden, because he fundamentally was a teacher. Right? Well, he was, every coach is a teacher, but he took great Yeah, pride. but he in particular was a teacher. And, and, I, and I, I mean, that was, that was his classroom, was the, was the basketball floor and the locker room and stuff. Uh, do you remember uh, riding on a bus with the team and being called up to the front because you thought he wanted to talk basketball with oh, you? Oh, yeah. He, you know, he was a Lincoln scholar, and along with writing really wonderful poetry, love poetry. And uh, we were... 
uh, it was the weekend where you play Washington and Seattle and then you take a, a plane to Spokane and, and a bus ride across the Palouse country out there in, uh, to go to Washington State. It's like being on the moon. And, uh, and there's a couple hour ride and it's beautiful in the big wheat, rolling wheat fields. And so I'm sitting in the back of the bus and the manager comes back and he says, Coach Wooden wants you to come up and sit with him. I'm going to go up and sit with Coach. I'm going to get so much material for the game on Monday night. Man, I'm ready. I've got my uh, pen and pad out. I'm really good. So I sit down. Coach says, uh, Enberg, you like poetry? What am I going to say? <laughs> oh, yeah, Coach. He said, Edna St. Vincent Millay? Oh, one of my favorites. And, uh, and, and he, he proceeds to be quoting some of his favorite Malay poems and then talks about it, writing his own poetry. Well, we finally get to Pullman, well, hold Washington. Up. What, what are you thinking during this time? I'm thinking Dude, maybe. I, want, I want to talk basketball. Yeah, of course, but I'm, I, I'm not going to interrupt the wizard. I mean, I'm not going to. And, and we finally get to, to Pullman, and he hasn't mentioned the word basketball in the whole, whole trip. And that, that's the kind of man. He, he's the greatest man, other than my own father, the greatest man I've ever met and known. And, and when he, uh, we were all rooting for him to reach 100 and he missed by about three months. And I saw him a couple of months before he died, and he was in good form, uh, fine fettle that day. Went to his apartment, apartment he's been living in in Sherman Oaks for, I mean, it's, it's just a little condo for 40 some years. Still has love letters to his wife on the pillow of the bed that they shared. Uh, and this particular day, he loved baseball. In fact, it was his favorite sport. A lot of people don't know that the Pittsburgh Pirates offered John Wooden the managerial job in the middle of his UCLA career, and of course he didn't take that. So we're, we're talking baseball the whole time. And we started to argue about our all-time left-handed hitting outfield. Well, Ted Williams, of course, is my guy, and Stan Musial was his favorite. And I think we got to put Babe Ruth in there someplace, right? And, and so we argued back and forth about the others. And we had a wonderful time talking baseball and the fact that he played shortstop as a kid and tried out with the Cincinnati Reds. And when it was all over and he, he was tiring, we'd been there an hour and a half, two hours, and said, Coach, thank you, love you. And he says, he called me over, pointed at his forehead. I kissed him on the forehead and, and left. And, and then when I got outside, I said, I, I feel like I just kissed a god. He was that kind of man. And so, so such a powerful influence on everyone he ever coached. And if you don't believe that, just call Bill Walton tonight. You'll find out. And then your relationship with Al McGuire. Totally it, it, different. Completely different. Completely different kind of person, different kind of coach. But you, you were so taken with his, his statements, you know, the things he would say, that you ended up writing a, 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 a play about this guy. Now, I, am I right is that that play came from a request for you to do a eulogy? Yeah, that started him. that way. That's, that was when, the when he died? germ of the idea. How many of you have seen it? It's a one-man, one-act play. Thank you. Some of you have seen it over at the North Coast Rep. Um, we just did a couple of performances a, a week ago. Um, and going back to writing again, here, here's a, a New York street genius. And he's working with this farm kid. He said, I'm so worried about you call me Dixie. Dixie, I'm so worried about you. You trust everybody. You know, somebody, somebody's going to take advantage of you. You know, a New York guy, he's going to have his hand on your wallet. I said, yeah, you, Al. I know. <laughs> uh, but he would, he would see things from a different angle in life that I would never have seen. And he would coach me up on those moments in life. Uh, you know, don't always go the same way. If you, if you always go left to work, now and then take a right. And you know, let the unexpected, the unplanned come to you. Uh, and he would do that. And it's a, it's a great lesson. We all should do that more often. Maybe not a whole day, but take an hour. Or maybe there's a Saturday, you hop in the car, and there's really no place to go. So you just start driving, and maybe you wind up in Alpine or someplace. And uh, he, would, he would have you know, sayings like, uh, no's a good answer. The bad answers, maybe. We all want yes, but no is a good answer. It allows you to go on and find a yes. If you're hanging on maybe, you're going to wait another hour or maybe another day or another week before you get an answer. So no is a good answer. So remember that, folks, when you go home tonight. And why do uh, the largest American flags fly over foreign car dealerships? Um, uh, <laughs> And if I, I, I love his line about the world is run by C plus yeah, students. The, yeah, the, the, the world is run by, by C plus students. Now, he, he, uh, he said that, for example, when he coached, 
He said, the last thing I wanted at the free throw line with the game tied in the final seconds is a Bula Bula guy. I mean, he meant, that meant one of the Ivy League guys. He said, one of the Bula Bula guys. They're too smart. And they're going to see all those guys waving and everything back there. I want a C plus student up there. Bang, bang. He didn't even see that. So, so, so he, so he, he, uh, he said that it, when my kids, his kids in Marquette, were, were graduated, when he get the piece of paper, the diploma, you got the piece of paper, but you're really not educated. If you want to get your master's and your doctorate in life, drive a cab for six months and 10 bar for six months. And what do you learn when you do that? He said, humanness was his word. Humanness. You learn people. You learn body action. You learn uh, what is the truth from, you know, from, like he said, the fly spots from the pepper in the shaker. You know, that the, the you learn what's going on in life. He says, like when I tended bar and I was also the bouncer, I learned in a hurry when the guy wanted to fight you, you always came over the bar feet first. Otherwise, you lean into the punch, you know? <laughs> so, so. Uh, you so, wrote a whole play with, yeah, with yeah, this, this is, kind I, of stuff. Yeah, this was, I mean, and, and I, since this is, we're supposed to be talking about writing, I'm sorry. Do no, I, no, 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 I'm, I'm do loving I, this. Do but, I have but, to give back my point? <laughs> yeah, now? yeah, you are a fraud no, and no, a no, hoax. But lay, this, yeah. <laughs> But, but here's what happened in writing that play. First of all, yeah, I'm going to get to answer your question after all. <laughs> that when he died, the family asked me if I would write the memorial notes for the program. That's a daunting task with only a couple of days to do it. And talk about a tough assignment. I couldn't get it. And I'm trying to write and then throw that away, throw that away. And I said, hey, I'm going to let him write him. He'll write it himself. And so I just did a little preface. I'm not going to try to write about Al McGuire, who n knew him Best of all, Al, and here were all of his what we called Maguireisms, and listed about 20 of the ones I gave you now. And then after he died in, in a couple of months, and we're renting a place uh, up on Mount Soledad, we were building a house in La Jolla, and I said, you know, he taught me so much, I'm going to write this down just so it, maybe it'll be a chapter in a book or something someday. But the more I wrote, the more I remembered, the more I wrote. And, and believe me, there were times at 3 in the morning I'd be writing and I could feel him right here saying, no, Dixie, not that way, this way. <laughs> and, and then I couldn't stop and I had to write again. It, so the play, while you know, I claim to be the playwright, no, 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 Al McGuire wrote it. I just copied it and put it ordered it and organized it so that it made some sense. It's a great play. I Thank have you. seen it. And, I, it. and it's a marvelous, marvelous yeah, the experience. Act, the actor truly brings this incredible street genius from New York to life. You said once that you got a lot of inspiration from your high school English teacher. What, what, did, what did she do that kind of got things connected with words and things like that for you? You know, I, I think it just was one of those, we only had about five teachers in our high school, hmm. and she was very demanding. And, uh, and I think, it, going back to see her after my education, she just saw something in me that she liked and knew that she could push me and say, you know, I would think that's got to be an A paper. And she'd bring me and say, oh, no, you've, you've got to do better than that. I can't give you an A for that. And she, you know, uh, she helped me to, uh, be honest with myself that there was more left in there and that I could always do better. And uh, that's what teachers, you know, we all do, huh? The teachers, you know, many are here because you give back to this university and here's my commercial for you. When I, when I went to Central Michigan with a $100 academic scholarship, hitchhiked to school with a borrowed sport coat and they gave me a chance with a hundred bucks to give this nobody a chance to be somebody. And you know, that's what you all are doing when you support Point Loma or any educational process. You're giving a lot of nobodies a chance to be somebody. And for that, we should be so grateful and give back. What better way to say thank you than to give back and let the next generation have the same chance. So keep, keep I, it up. I had nothing to do with that statement right there. <laughs> I, just, I just want you to know. So, so education, the difference, I wonder if this is maybe the difference between academia and sports. Do you remember the, uh, the title of your doctoral dissertation? Oh, yeah, it was the... It's a 400-page... This guy's got a PhD. So it, it, it's a 400-page doctoral dissertation. Do you remember the title? Oh, gosh, it was complicated. It was a, a com going through all the uh, uh, research and professional thought on the prevention of athletic injuries, something to that effect. I've got it here. 
It's an analysis and synthesis of research and professional thought on the health and welfare of the athlete with emphasis on prevention of athletic injury. That's the title of your, of your doctoral dissertation. And the title of your memoir, on the other hand, is Oh My. <laughs> is that the end? <laughs> yeah, we're out. <laughs> There's a little difference there. Yeah. That, that was a fraud again because um, <laughs> yeah, here we go. They, they, it was uh, you get down to hit, uh, having to write your dissertation, and now where do you go now? You need some help. And the uh, university, the the School of Health and Physical Education, said, you know, we really don't know what we don't know about preventing athletic injuries. We need a library research. So I spent a full year in the library and interviewing people for their professional thought about what can we do to prevent athletic injuries. At that time, you know, they were, the kids were playing football and there was a no-no to drink water, you know, as, as an example. So we were at least able to expose that as not a good idea. What, bourbon was better? Or? <laughs> no, that was just not manly enough. If you have to stop and have water while you're oh, practicing football, yep. middle of, you know, September, October, where you're, you're wearing that heavy uniform. And so anyway, it was uh, hopefully a contribution. It was a, the idea of the, the dissertation is somebody could take what I started and then build off that and, and do even more important work. You know, I think one of your great traits as a, uh, as a writer, as a broadcaster, when people see you in public, is, uh, is your humility. This, it, it just comes through in everything. Even you're talking about, you know, you're being a fraud or a hoax or whatever, which is, of course, absurd. The, the part about you being a fraud and hoax. I, <laughs> I, I do think you're, you're, you're a very humble man. In fact, one person who worked with you, I thought, paid you the highest compliment. He said, the thing about Dick Enberg is that he doesn't know he's Dick Enberg. So what, where, is this the central Michigan, the farm boy it's humility? A, it's a Finnish father. My dad was a really tough, full-blooded Finn. Anyone with Finnish heritage here? Maybe there's a couple of you, yeah. In fact, Enberg is really a Swedish name. The Finnish name was Katiavori. But when the grandparents came over, uh, that was a mouthful, and they decided to change Katiavori, which, if they had gone English, it would be Juniper Mountain. I'd be Dick Juniper Mountain. Uh, which, uh, yeah, I kind of like that in a way. Um, and, uh, Tough to get uh, out of Jersey. It, but. It, it, well, but, but you know, it's kind of Native American in yeah, a way. Yeah, 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 it works. And, and so my dad uh, grew up as a Depression father, and um, he really, and I think a lot of uh, fathers were that way, did not want to be too complimentary, never said I love you, you never did it quite well enough, you better do it better. And there's a, an incident that changed my life and still resonates with me to this day. I came home, told you about basketball, we weren't very good. We won two games, and this one game I had my best game, I scored 23, 24 points. And dad went to every game, he was always there, I always knew he was there supporting. And uh, my mother had left, they, they were divorced. My dad had, in this old farmhouse, he had a, his bedroom upstairs. I came home from the game, went up to uh, his bedroom, and he was still awake, and sat down on the edge of his bed, and said, uh, how'd you like the game? He said, hey, finally won one, that was good. Uh, and I made, we made some small talk, and I'm waiting for him to acknowledge the fact that I had one heck of a game, and didn't come, so I said, uh, Gosh, I think I, I think I went for 23, 24 points tonight. And he said, yeah, and your man had 27. <laughs> and uh, wow. I, I said, it's really going to break your heart someday to say something nice about me, it, isn't it? And this sounds rude and tough, but it's, I love this man. He grabbed me by the shoulder and pushed me off the edge of his bed and said, the day you think you're so good that you can't improve, you can only go one way. And he pushed me out of his room. Well, that, you know, that was a driving force all my life. I still think of him. I think of times where, you know, I could take a little shortcut here. Boy, would my dad be upset if he saw me do that. So he's still, still pushing me. I will say this to complete the story, because I know some of you women, you don't even say, I love you to your son. Uh, when I was divorced for eight years, single for eight years, uh, I finally coaxed my dad to come out and live with me in California. I lived in the, just off uh, Hollywood Bowl in, in the San Fernando Valley. And he was my plumber and my electrician and my gardener, and he did all that kind of thing. And I was the cook and paid for him to play golf. And he came out looking in 90 and, and was probably 65 at the time. And after a year playing golf and being around, he would now look 50. He was a handsome, handsome man. And, and as I'd go off to do games, 
I, w I would say, now this is the day when I go out the front door, I'm gonna say, I, I love you, Dad. And something would happen, the phone would ring, or he would leave, or whatever. And finally one day, I'm, I'm, I'm leaving town to do a game, and he uh, was fully supportive of that, and I said, Dad, I gotta tell you, I love you, and I hugged him, and I could just feel him resisting the hug. <laughs> and, uh, and then the next time I did it again, and I, I continued, and then one day, he said, I love you too, son. And we completed our relationship. When he died, he had meager effects. He never made more than $8,000 a year as a farmer. And, and we found these shoe boxes. And what he would do when I was on the road call, whether it was UCLA or calling the NFL games or uh, college basketball, or ten, he had a, a little tape recorder and he would put his microphone uh, against the TV uh, speaker and he would tape in his own way my games. And he had them all organized. And so after he died, here he is, my dad had listened to every game and that was his way of really saying, I was okay and he loved me. Wow, wow. That's beautiful. That is just beautiful. So we're head heading into the last season for you broadcasting for the Padres. And I'm wondering if your preparation, your kind of how you're thinking about it is, is going to be any different. Um, I remember you wrote a statement uh, one time about uh, that you still study as hard as anyone in the business. You said, kids hate homework, I enjoy it. But this is the line I, I thought was really, really interesting. I don't want to cut back on preparation. You said, you said this a few years ago. I could fool the network and fool the public for two or three years, but I couldn't fool myself for one game. Is that how you're going to approach this last season too? Absolutely. I want, I want this to be my best year. And uh, maybe fate will come positively toward me. We've never had a Padre pitch a no-hitter, right? And that's, that's as delicious as it gets as a sportscaster. Maybe this will be the year. That'd be a nice little treat. Maybe uh, a team that no one is taking seriously, at least uh, this early in the year, although we're tied for first place right now, by the way. Um, <laughs> yeah, we haven't, we, haven't, we haven't lost any games at all. We haven't lost a game yet. Uh, that, uh, you know, the, the preparation is really part of the fun of the job because it's like preparing to give your lecture as an educator. You know, you find some material that really is, is interesting. So maybe no one else has had that nugget before and you're able to share that with your audience and you just have that feeling that, you know, somebody's gonna get that. Somebody's gonna make, think that the telecast is better because we included that within our reportage. So yes, I would, I'd be terribly disappointed and my father too, uh, if I didn't uh, make this the best year of my career. And so that's the way I'm gonna approach it. I'm sure we'll recognize that. So my last question, we've got a bunch of writers, wannabe writers in the audience and people who'll be watching this are aspiring writers as well. What advice would you have, not just for, for people who wanna go into sports, sports writing, but you're a good writer. I don't care what you think about whether you're a hoax or not, you're a good writer. What, what advice do you have for the people who want to go into this a little bit. See, my, <clears throat> my education as a writer was in a small farm town high school. Um, my major was health and physical education to get a master's and doctorate. My writing experience really was writing term papers and writing a master's thesis and a, and a doctoral dissertation. So, you know, there wasn't, you know, where, where did it all come from? I, um, and so the, the advice is, gee, if, you can, if you've got some basic intelligence and talent and curiosity and imagination, something we had that the kids today don't have, we had radio and we had our imaginations and we saw something that no one else saw, but we saw it vividly, where today is, oh, that's it, there it is, TV, saw it. Uh, we, we were able to use our minds and our creativity and imagination and just listening to the radio. That was pretty good training. I, come to, I hadn't thought of that, but that was good training. And so I tell young people, the young people that, uh, you know, writers are going to take all the writing classes naturally, but broadcasters, a lot of young broadcasters just want to study sports. 
No, 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 no. Take every writing class that you have the opportunity. You know, take, write, write, write. All the, and I will go back to the start. The best sportscasters are good writers. And uh, you don't have to win a Nobel Prize, but you better be able to write and think uh, like a writer. So use that experience. And, and don't be just, uh, you know, one-sided. You know, it, my friend George is here, and I'm just am amazed at how well he writes and how he's interested in so many other activities, but also deeply involved in sports. And I think that's part of being a good communicator, a good broadcaster, a good writer, is to know a, a wide uh, span of uh, exciting things that happen in our lives and be interested in other things and use that as part. You know, the, the, the using uh, the, the simile, you know, is part of, you know, part of what you do as a broadcaster, so why not incorporate it as, as a writer? So um, I, I'm really complimented and humbled by your saying those nice things, Dean. And, it's true. Uh, but but um, I, I'm just glad to be on the team. You know, I'm glad to be on the team. Dr. Dick Enberg, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.